Hey, 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 everybody out there in YouTube land. Welcome back to our regular Tuesday for kids at four o'clock. And today we are going to be reading about and learning about the POMO. And I am not an expert on this, so if I pronounce something wrong or get a fact wrong, definitely let me know. So we have been talking about um, different native cultures and we've been talking about um, Native Americans that have lived where we are living before us. And um, gosh, who did we, we talked about um, the Tongva, of course. And, <clears throat> sorry, we talked about the Miwok. And this week we are talking about the Pomo. And then next week we have something totally different. We're done with our Native California series. Um, so for today, like always, we're gonna talk about um, this book with some super interesting facts. This is by Nia Kennedy. And um, then I also found a legend online. Um, and it is about how the sun and the moon came to be. So that's going to be pretty cool. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. This is the Pomo. Pomo Man in traditional dance costume, 1924. Kind of cool. Now, and these guys, these are from Northwestern California. So they are not from Southern California, but I wanted to cover a few different areas. So here we are. The early Pomo Indians lived in Northern California in parts of Mendocino, Sonoma, and Lake Counties. They divided themselves into seven groups. Each had its own language, customs, and traditions. Because the languages of these groups had many similar features, scholars have collectively called these people the Pomo. Prior to contact with Europeans, the seven groups didn't describe themselves as a single group. However, since 1851, most of them call themselves the Pomo. And that makes me wonder, what situations did they have that made them decide that their group of people should be called by one name? Scholars estimate that in 1800, there were likely more than 8,000 Pomo in Northern California. Since that time, <clears throat> the Pomo have faced many challenges, including repeated invasions of their land. Sorry, I have to get comfortable here. <laughs> including repeated invasions of their land. Well, that's a story that we keep hearing throughout the history of the people that were indigenous to this place. Isn't that the truth? So, since that time, the Pomo has faced many challenges, including repeated invasions of their land. As more newcomers arrived, the Pomo, along with other American Indians, were killed or forced to leave their lands. Do you see a theme through the past three weeks? By 1900, the Pomo had lost control of nearly all their land. Today, they continue to fight for their civil rights and fair treatment. Throughout their history, the Pomo people have been hunters, fishermen, warriors, craftspeople, and traders. Their story is one of hard work and courage. Village life. Oh, this is a great picture. The Pomo often spent part of the year away from their villages in places where food was available. They lived in temporary campsites in shelters made of poles and thatch. Look at that. So that's like our tent, right? You gotta go somewhere temporarily, you bring your tent, there you go. 
Each of the regions in which the seven Pomo groups lived contained many villages. Small villages had as few as 12 homes, while larger villages could have more than 100. The Pomo built their homes in different styles using different materials depending on where they lived. Every Pomo village had a sweat house. These round structures were built inside a pit and covered with a layer of earth. Inside, a fire filled the space with smoke and heat. Men took daily sweat baths for cleansing, healing, and enjoyment. In some communities, the men slept and spent most of their free time in the sweat house. There was at least one assembly house in each village. Assembly houses were used for ceremonies and meetings. These buildings had a special section of wall that could be pushed away for a quick escape in case of an emergency, such as a fire. Preparing meals. Most Pomo often prepared their meals outside. They usually cooked over an open flame, but some foods were grilled, smoked, or steamed. The Pomo used a number of methods to prepare their meals. They often used pit ovens. To make one of these ovens, they dug a hole in the ground and built a fire inside. After a while, the fuel was removed to put out the fire, leaving the rocks and soil hot enough to cook the food. We've heard this before, haven't we? The food, which was usually wrapped in leaves, was put inside the hole and covered with hot rocks. After a few hours, the meal was ready to eat. I'm ready. Sounds good. The early Pomo were also experts at cooking stews inside tightly woven baskets using hot rocks. Acorns and dried plants were stored in baskets or similar containers. The Pomo preserved all their leftover food for later use or trade. They salted or smoked fish and meat to prevent these foods from spoiling. Ooh. Beautiful baskets. Oh yes, look at that. The Pomo Indians were experts at making beautiful crafts and useful tools. The women collected many kinds of grasses and other plants to weave into baskets decorated with geometric patterns. Beads and feathers were sometimes added for extra decoration. Many types and sizes of baskets were produced, including plates, bowls, and jars. And then many experts believe the Pomo created and continue to make the finest baskets on earth. Kind of cool, huh? Obsidian, a glass-like volcanic rock, which you could still find if you head up north, was skillfully chipped into arrowheads, drills, knives, and various other cutting tools. The surfaces of special rocks called magnesite were smoothed to make beautiful beads. Wood, bark, and reeds were also used to make items such as bows, cloth, and smoking pipes. The Pomo made many useful things from the animals they hunted. They used animal skins to make blankets and clothing. Bones were crafted into jewelry, fish hooks, and other items. They also made items from seashells and bird feathers. Pomo society. The average Pomo family had about 14 people in it. The woman pictured here is using a carrier called a cradle board to carry her baby. I love these old pictures, they're so cool. All right, extended families were the smallest social groups in Pomo communities. When a couple married, they could move near either the husband or wife's family. It was common for extended families to unite into a single larger group that was headed by the oldest family members. Most villages included several larger family units. Household chores were usually assigned based on a person's age and if they were male or female. 
Outside the home, most men and many women had jobs. There were bead makers, hunters, basket makers, bow and arrow makers, and more. Each group formed its own trade organization. A person had to study many years before they could join or practice without supervision. The wealthiest and most powerful men were the political leaders, often called chiefs. Different governments. Religious and medical leaders were also important in Pomo society. The most powerful of these men and women were known as bear doctors. This is a picture of a bear doctor. The village community was the basic unit of government for the Pomo people. Each of the seven original groups had their own lands and a central settlement. The largest Pomo group may have had a number of smaller independent villages and as many as 2,000 total members. The system of government of each early Pomo group was different. In some communi communities, there was a single major leader or chief. In other Pomo villages, a chief had several aides. Some leaders inherited their positions while others were elected by the community's adults. In some communities, the oldest people from each extended family came together with others to form a village council or assembly. Pomo villages sometimes formed temporary alliances with each other. This meant that a few leaders had control of multiple villages for short periods of time. These alliances often quickly broke down, as you can imagine. Pomo warriors. Ooh, let's look at the stone knives they used. That's kind of cool. And then the Pomo people started wars over many things, such as control of land and natural resources. That also sounds familiar. Warfare was important to the early Pomo people. Some wars began when religious leaders of one community performed rituals designed to hurt the people of another village. Once one side had been defeated or hurt, the other side often wanted revenge. To prepare for battle, Pomo warriors held religious ceremonies in which they prayed and worshiped with special dances and songs. The religious leaders tried to use supernatural powers to predict what would happen during the fighting. Sometimes a war was settled by a ritual battle in which armies came together at a chosen place to trade insults and arrows. These ritual battles ended when someone was killed. In exchange for peace, the losers had to give something up. The winning warriors sometimes held special ceremonies to celebrate their victory. Rituals and healing. Oh, look. So there is a Pomo doctor's headdress. And then here, what is that? Oh, the early Omo Pomo people believed certain places in nature had special powers. This rock was thought to help women have babies. Huh, interesting. Religion was an important part of life for the Pomo people. From the time they were born, young people were taught songs, dances, and religious stories. Religion helped the Pomo make sense of the world and learn how to be good people. Most of their holidays and rituals were connected to their religious beliefs. The Pomo held special ceremonies to bring them power, health, and good fortune. There were also many ceremonies for boys and girls that marked special occasions as they grew up. Beautiful religious services bark, marked the passing of the seasons. Pomo religious leaders spent much of their time working as doctors. They often treated sick people by using special plants and performing rituals, special songs, and dances. People paid the doctors in goods or bead money. Doctors were sometimes feared because it was believed they could hurt people with poisons. Many of the Pomo people still practice their religion today. Russian newcomers. Between 1542 and 1812, 
the ships of many different European countries sailed by the Pomo lands. Many were Spanish merchant vessels. After 1750, Spain and Russia began their expansion efforts in North America. The Russians were the first newcomers to meet the Pomo people. In 1812, they established Fort Ross along the coast in present-day Sonoma County. The Russians didn't want to control California the way the Spanish did. They were more interested in creating farms and ranches and making money by collecting and selling seal and sea otter skins. At first, the Russians and the Pomo got along well. The Pomo considered the Russians to be good trading partners and military allies. The Russians helped keep the Spaniards and other Pomo enemies away. However, in 1830, troops at Fort Ross forced the Pomo to work without pay. This ruined the good relationship between the Russians and the Pomo people. The Russian American Fur Company owned Fort Ross. In 1841, the company decided that the cost of keeping the colony was greater than the profits it was making. The Russians closed the fort and sold the buildings to the Mexican government. The Spanish missions. Oh, there we go again. King Carlos III of Spain sent people to take control of California in 1769. It wasn't until about 1817, however, that Spanish explorers arrived in Pomo territory. Spanish officials wanted to block the Russians and expand their control of California. The Spanish built missions to convince Spain's American Indian allies to adopt the Christian religion and European lifestyle. However, the mission program in Mexico territory, which California was a part of at the time, ended when the country gained independence from Spain in 1821. By 1823, Europeans and members of various other American Indian groups frequently passed through Pomo territory, bringing new ideas and trade goods, as well as deadly diseases. In 1822, the Mexican government began to give private ranches in Pomo territory to retired soldiers. The new ranches would help Mexico keep its hold on California. The remaining missions were quickly turned into new kinds of settlements. Some Southern Pomo people moved to Mission San Rafael, which was built in 1817. Over the next 18 years, at least 600 members of the Northern Pomo group also moved to missions. Scholars aren't sure what mission life was like for the Pomo people. Trouble with Mexico. Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo was a military commander of the Republic of Mexico. He hoped to expand Mexico's control over the California area, block the Russians, and conquer the Pomo people. After 1835, California's system of government broke down and wealthy landowners fought over who would rule. Ranchers thought the American Indians should be slaves and treated them very poorly. Many people living at the missions escaped to the east and organized raiding parties with other American Indian groups. Between 1835 and 1847, these raiders stole thousands of horses and cattle from Mexican towns and ranches. Many of the settlements had to be abandoned. Changes in government policies meant that Mission San Francisco Solano de Sonoma was turned into a military base ruled by Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo. To expand Mexican control, Vallejo gave ranches to his followers and family members. Between 1835 and 1847, many Pomo people died while fighting or because of harsh treatment or diseases. Thousands of others became slaves. For the Pomo communities that managed to survive, the hard times were just beginning. The unstoppable United States. Some Pomo people worked for very little pay and were allowed to live outside the government reserves in new communities called rancherias. When they weren't working, many Pomo people tried to preserve their ancient ways of life. 
The U.S.-Mexican War, 1846 to 1848, ended with a treaty that forced Mexico to transfer control of California to the United States. Things didn't improve for the American Indians under the new government, which denied nearly all American Indian people, including the Pomo, their basic human rights. Some American officials believed that the American Indians should be exterminated or killed off. From 1850 through 1900, nearly all the Pomo lands were stolen by gold rush settlers who found valuable resources there. Many of the defeated Pomo people were forced to move to the Mendocino Indian Reservation or the Round Valley Reservation because they had nowhere else to go. By the end of the 19th century, many Pomo people had saved enough money to purchase land and rebuild their old communities. Legal problems soon threatened the new settlements, but the Pomo people continued to fight for their rights. Changes in the 20th century. When the reservations closed years later, the lack of government support may have made it harder for many Pomo people, like the man shown here, to preserve their culture. By the beginning of the 20th century, the outsider's hatred toward the Pomo people had started to decline. Life began improving for them. After 1910, U.S. government officials began a new policy of working to create reservations for the homeless American Indians of California. For the next 10 years, 52 communities were created, including several Pomo rancherias. In 1924, American Indians were granted the full benefits of United States citizenship, including the right to vote. After World War II ended, however, American Indians faced new challenges. Some government officials wanted to get rid of the reservation system. In 1966, the government closed a number of reservations and divided the lands among the people who lived there. Yet again, the Pomo people found it necessary to organize themselves to preserve and protect their rights. The Pomo people today. In 1990, nearly 5,000 people identified themselves as members of the Pomo people. Ancient customs remain important to the Pomo, both on and off reservations. Family life continues to be the focus of many traditions. Large numbers of young Pomo people are learning their ancient languages and taking part in traditional activities, such as dancing, singing, storytelling, basket making, and cooking. The artwork of the Pomo is respected throughout the world. Pomo doctors continue to treat patients with ancient methods. The Pomo have dealt with many hardships over the last several centuries, and they continue to face challenges today. Even with their great efforts and many victories, the Pomo people are still often denied the rights that are extended to other American Indians and U.S. citizens. Today, the Pomo continue to fight for the rights and respect they deserve. So, that is about the Pomo. And so, like so many other um, native cultures, they definitely have stories about coyote. And of course, I have one to share with you today. You knew that was coming. Uh, this one is called The Origin of Light. I found it on online um, at Galinomera Legends. So hopefully you will like this one. Because one thing I learned when I was looking into these, to all of these, these traditional narratives, to these stories, they're told differently. And some of them are very detailed and told like for adults. So it was really hard to find one that would just be simple and just one part of the story. Because it's a very, very long story and very detailed. So there's a shorter version. And this one is called The Origin of Light. And they mean, well, I will tell you what they mean when I read this story. In the earliest beginning, the darkness was thick and deep. There was no light. The animals ran here and there, always bumping into each other. The birds flew here and there, but continually knocked against each other. Hawk and Coyote thought a long time about the darkness. Then, 
coyote felt his way into a swamp and found a large number of dry tule reeds. He made a ball of them. He gave the ball to Hawk with some flints and Hawk flew up into the sky where he touched off the tule reeds and sent the bundle whirling around the world. But the nights were dark. So Coyote made another bundle of tule reeds and Hawk flew into the air with them and touched them off with the flints. But these reeds were damp and did not burn so well. That is why the moon does not give so much light as the sun. So there you go. And next week, oh, hold on, hold on while I duck out of the picture for a minute. Oh, I think next week is poetry. Actually, I can just, maybe I can check right now while we're here. Let me do that. Events. Yes, okay. So I can give you a preview next week. This is the one we're gonna talk about. So that is my story. And thank you for joining us. I hope you are off to an awesome school year and I cannot wait to see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>